<coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Hassan. I, uh, this is a, a very appropriate introduction into uh, the topic directly, into the workings of uh, regional capitalism, with even the iron fist. <laughs> Although we are in a time of uprising, so I'm not sure it can really work, but good luck. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for, uh, jokes aside, for, uh, for having uh, hosted this, uh, this event uh, as uh, London Middle East uh, Institute and for accepting to, to, to chair it. And many thanks to, to uh, my very good friends, Salwa Smail, Nadil Ali, and Adam Haniyi, for accepting to, to be part of, uh, of, of this event, which... Uh, uh, I wanted to be a uh, uh, more open discussion about uh, the events themselves than just purely, as may happen often, a kind of presentation or summary of, uh, of my own book. So that's why we have this, this kind of uh, very, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure, uh, very interesting panel, as, as you will see. Now, uh, a few words uh, uh, <coughs> on on the book and the, therefore, as I just said, on, uh, on the events uh, be, beyond, the, beyond the book. Uh, well, I mean, from the subtitle of the book, uh, you will see that this is, and as the uh, title of this event also refers to, this is a book about uh, the Arab uprising, and that's already a choice. It's not the Arab Spring, as is so often, as it is so often described uh, uh, in the media, and this is also an attempt at, uh, at giving a radical explanation, exploration, and therefore explanation, of uh, of this uh, of this uprising. Uh, uh, the, I mean, the two, if you want, are are uh, oh yeah, I mean, these issues are uh, uh, narrowly connected because I think it's only through a superficial impression that uh, people could believe, at least at the beginning, that this would be a rather brief uh, episode uh, with regime fallings like uh, dominoes like we had in uh, Eastern Europe in the late 80s, early 90s, <laughs> and opening the way uh, for uh, rather smooth transitions. So the Eastern European model was uh, very much uh, evoked at the beginning of, uh, of the, the events in 2011 uh, uh, in the region. Now, the, the fact is for, I, I guess, for people who are really familiar with the region, uh, with its social, economic, political structure and the rest, uh, uh, and for uh, at least uh, I for one as one of them, uh, was convinced from the, the beginning that what we were facing, of course, was at least potentially a much more complicated and one should say also, alas, uh, a, mar a much more violent uh, 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 process. And I, I, I insisted from the beginning on the fact that uh, far from being a spring or whatever, which are indications of a rather short-lived, uh, br brief uh, moment in, in history, uh, what started at the end of 2010 and beginning of 2011 in the region uh, is a long-term revolutionary process, and that's why the term process here uh, is important. It's, it points to, I mean, the revolutionary character of the process, but it is a process which is not a finished revolution anywhere uh, 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 until this, uh, the, this, uh, this point and a, a process that, that will uh, carry on for a very long time, for several years, and very, very probably, actually, uh, decades, uh, given the complexity, again, of, uh, of the, the, the overall setup that exists uh, uh, in, in the region. And the meaning, precisely, and that's where the, the, the connection exists, uh, it is when you get in a radical exploration of of, uh, of, this, of these events that you understand, I believe, what I just explained. That is the process, the complexity of it, and all that. And by radical, I'm taking here radical in, 
uh, in the, 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 the etymological meaning of, uh, of the term, which is going back to the roots. And if, if we explore really the roots of, of these, uh, these events, then we, we understand uh, why uh, it's not anywhere near of, uh, of uh, reaching any kind of end uh, uh, presently. Uh, and I mean, for someone based in development studies as I am, I mean, this, uh, this kind of radical analysis uh, is almost uh, the, the uh, natural inclination uh, for, uh, uh, in the sense uh, that we are, we give, we are uh, accustomed to give uh, much attention, major attention, to social and economic uh, conditions. And that's one of the uh, peculiarities or uh, words, singularities of this book compared to so many other uh, books that have been produced uh, on, on these events. It is that it starts from an exploration of, uh, of uh, the, the, the social and economic conditions, and from there it goes into analyzing the social and political dynamics of w what I call, therefore, a revolutionary process, and uh, uh, a long-term one in the sense that if we understand the causes, the root causes of uh, what exploded in 2011, then we understand that it won't stop before these root causes are addressed, before they find any kind of solution, and that's why, again, we are not anywhere near this kind of, uh, of, uh, of conclusion. Now, <clears throat> the purpose of the book is precisely to, to, to analyze us and give the readers keys to understanding what is unfolding. It, it was not uh, meant as, let's say, uh, just a conjectural book, uh, analysis of just uh, uh, one year of events or whatever, it, it was meant as precisely that, giving a, 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 a prism uh, uh, through which, uh, or a grid through which you could analyze the events, the unfolding events, and of course this also is, of, uh, is a, um, uh, let's say, means also going through the test of, uh, of, of these events. I mean, uh, and so it's up to every reader to see whether the, the book uh, uh, stands this test of events or has been or not uh, uh, turned or obsolete with, with the events. My, of course, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an author, uh, I would tend to, to believe that it gives, uh, uh, on the contrary, it has been in, in a way confirmed by, by the, uh, by the uh, unfolding events. Uh, but of course I leave it up to, 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 to uh, each one of us to, uh, reading uh, uh, the book to, to come to any, any conclusions of the sort. Now the roots that are anyhow analyzed in the book, which are permanent, I mean as long uh, as this is going on, uh, starts from, as I said, the, the, the social and economic roots uh, the, the, the most uh, obvious uh, uh, aspect of which, I don't have any time to get into details, but the most obvious aspect of which is, is the, 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 the massive unemployment that characterizes the region with the highest rates uh, of unemployment in the world, and it has been like that for several decades, uh, uh, and, and especially uh, 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 female and youth unemployment, and of course when we say youth, it's female and, and male, that is uh, uh, gender and, uh, and age uh, uh, determination of, uh, of this massive uh, unemployment. And uh, uh, the youth uh, uh, dimension of this unemployment is, is uh, one of the key roots of, of the, the uprising because as usual, and uh, some people behaved as, or, or, or mentioned, or, or commented as if this was very particular to these events that, uh, that you had the youth uh, in the streets, but the, root, the, 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 the truth is that there are no third age revolutions, and usually all revolutionary movements are movements of, uh, of I mean, led by young people, where young people uh, represent the core uh, of, uh, of the movement. Uh, uh, and so this, ha the connection here is, is, is direct, and this unemployment, which itself is one symptom among others, I, I, as I said, I'm not getting into, into uh, a long explanation here, is related to the uh, uh, economic uh, uh, blockage that the region have been going through for the last few decades, 
with uh, an exceptionally slow uh, uh, rate of, uh, of economic uh, uh, growth, uh, uh, especially when compared to uh, demographic, uh, the, the demographic rate, and this translates into this massive uh, uh, unemployment. And this uh, slow growth or lack of it, this fetter development, as I call it, is the title of the first chapter, is connected, is related to a, a, a particularly low investment rate uh, uh, in the region. And when we explore the reasons for that, we get into what I call, for lack of, a, for want of a better word, but it sounds heavy, but uh, that's, I think, the, the most precise, I call that the regional modalities of the capital, the regional, or let's say the specific modalities of the uh, uh, regional capitalist uh, uh, mode of production. Uh, and these are determined by the, the characters uh, of the social political structures that prevail in this region, where we have the highest concentration uh, uh, in the world of, of frontier states, and this is a well-known uh, feature of the region on which there have been so many, many uh, comments, and sometimes a stretch uh, beyond uh, beyond what is useful, but it is nevertheless an obvious feature of, uh, of, uh, of, of the, the states in the region and the patrimonial character of, of these states. And uh, I'm not saying even neo-patrimonial, actually the neo-patrimonial states in the region are those which are relatively, you know, have relatively some kind of, uh, of, uh, of semi-liberal uh, conditions and they are very rare, very few. The, 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 the characteristic of the region is that you have uh, uh, full or let's say uh, patrimonialism so much present in whether in monarchies or so-called republics where uh, with uh, families owning, uh, fully owning uh, the states and behaving as owners of the state uh, uh, and transmitting and hereditary uh, and, and the rest. And this comes also under conditions of politically, of what Max Weber calls politically determined uh, capitalism. That is a capitalism that is uh, very much dependent on the political connection, uh, which leads uh, therefore to what's called crony capitalism and the rest, creating conditions which if you combine them with the unpredictability of governments uh, because of arbitrariness, because of the despotic character, with the unpredictability of, of conditions because of the fact that this is one of the most unstable uh, uh, and violent uh, uh, torn uh, regions in the world, uh, leads to uh, a, a specific form of, of uh, a dominant form of, of private capitalism in the region, which is uh, uh, seek only short-term, quick profit uh, investments. And this is one of the major keys uh, to explain uh, everything I mentioned. Now, if we add to the, this structure, which is a heavy one, uh, that uh, is dominating the societies uh, of, of the region, these political, social political structures. The uh, uh, historical uh, major role of, uh, of foreign powers and also the intra-regional role of regional powers, uh, then we understand why this is not Eastern Europe, uh, uh, <coughs> but uh, a region where, where the revolutionary process is much more complex, will take much more time, and will be and is already much, uh, unfortunately, much more, uh, much more violent. And this revolutionary process is actually facing, uh, as I, I, I call that in a, in a recent article, uh, uh, one revolution, se several, I mean, at least three counter-revolutions. <laughs> there are several forms of counter-revolution uh, in, in the region. Uh, one is the most obvious, the, the old regimes. Everywhere where you have the revolutionary uh, process or uprising, it is facing old regimes, uh, which are, m in most cases, much more uh, present than the, uh, the term fulul, which has been popularized in Egypt, would indicate this much more than fulul, and that we have seen it recently. The, the deep state, which is another formula which comes from Turkey originally, uh, is actually more accurate in, uh, in indicating uh, what is existing. And that's one form, of course, the most obvious, most direct form of counter-revolution. You have the counter-revolutionary role of, of global powers, 
of course, the United States, the, the, the major hegemon in the region, but at least in one circumstance, uh, which is the Syrian case, Russia is also playing a very direct counter-revolutionary role. We have the role of regional powers. Uh, uh, of course, the Gulf monarchies, the, the traditional bastions of, uh, of reaction and counter-revolution uh, in the region, but also, and here again in the Syrian case, Iran, which is not uh, to be forgotten uh, in, that, uh, in that regard. And the, the, those reg I mean, the regional powers, and here I'm, I'm speaking the, uh, of the, the Gulf monarchies and the United States being be behind them, uh, have been uh, trying to uh, co-opt the uprising by using the counter-revolutionary, or as counter-revolutionary means, uh, uh, some f local forces in the countries where the, the uprising is, is going on. And this has been uh, the case, of course, uh, uh, very obviously of, uh, of forces referring to, to f Islamic fundamentalist forms of uh, types of, of program, whether uh, uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood and behind them uh, uh, the Emirate of Qatar, or, uh, or, or the Salafis uh, uh, and behind them the, 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 the Saudi Kingdom, and various other forms of, uh, of, uh, of forces which may be linked to not necessarily state, but also to some uh, funding networks that exist in the Gulf, Gulf countries. Now, uh, uh, one thing is that it was obvious, again, for people familiar with the region, that any elections organized shortly after the uh, uh, upheaval uh, in, uh, in countries like Egypt and Tunisia, etc., would lead to the results that we have seen. Uh, it's most obvious in the case of, uh, of, uh, of Egypt that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, was by far the, the most powerful organized force uh, existing and uh, had absolutely no match in any other uh, 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 element of the, uh, of the opposition. And uh, uh, this, I mean, this was uh, inevitable for elections uh, held in that, uh, in that short term. And I, I would say that the movements have had, have, didn't have or haven't had uh, the, the, uh, enough conscience of the issue uh, of, of, uh, of uh, 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 I mean, understanding that any elections under su such circumstances should be for very short terms and not for normal four-year terms or whatever, and we have seen the consequences uh, in Egypt. Now, faced with these uh, victories, electoral victories, we have heard so many gloomy uh, uh, comments and people shifting from the euphoria of the first initial uh, month of the, 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 the uprising to a uh, very, very gloomy uh, depiction of what's happening. The Islamic tsunami, the Islamic winter, the Islamic autumn, the, well, you name it, all, all kind of, uh, of, uh, of formulas of, uh, of, this, of this kind. Well, this was again, misunderstanding of what's happening, a very superficial impression, be precisely because people had not understood that this long-term revolutionary character of the process uh, that uh, I mentioned. And it manifested itself quite uh, quickly in the very fast, I mean, much faster than even uh, whoever might have expected, the very fast downfall of the Muslim uh, Brotherhood in Egypt, and now the, 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 the massive opposition that Nahda is facing uh, in, uh, in Tunisia. Now, <clears throat> of course, this has uh, led again to us, uh, another uh, attempt at co-opting uh, the uprising. And the idea that the, the coup that uh, uh, co-opted this second uprising in Egypt after the coup that co-opted the, the, the first one uh, is, again, the end of the process. So, Sometimes the same people, sometimes different people are also proclaiming now it's another end. It's now, it's the end, uh, not the Islamic winter, but maybe the military, the military uh, winter or whatever season. Uh, uh, it is again a very superficial uh, uh, impression. Uh, the, I, I mean, there are no conditions in the region for any progressive remake of, uh, of uh, uh, Bonapartism in the sense that there is no room for economic development under such conditions. Uh, uh, Bonapartism, the region has already seen. It's behind, it's not ahead. Huh? And, uh, and whoever rules countries like Egypt and the rest uh, uh, want, and no one appears to have any kind of, uh, 
of, 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 of solution, and it takes radical solution, the other sense of radical, uh, to, to, to uh, overcome this, the, the economic blockage. Therefore, whoever doesn't have such solutions will just uh, fail and uh, face the same thing. Uh, and likewise, I would say the increasing role of Islamic fundamentalist forces in the Syrian uprising, when it turned into military confrontation and civil war, is no more the end of the revolution or the revolutionary process than, for instance, the Muslim Brotherhood electoral victories uh, were uh, in Egypt or, or, uh, or, or, or Tunisia. Uh, 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 the, the, the military weight of such forces, which again is because they have better means, uh, and especially funding, uh, than the rest is not much matched by, by, by any mass adherence to, to their views and behavior, and that's why, uh, uh, I mean, of course, it's an ex extremely tragic situation that uh, what we have, it's a terrible tragedy what we have in Syria, but uh, uh, there is no uh, basis, in my view, to just bury the revolution w uh, with the, uh, at, at the same time. The process is going on. It's going on, as we can see, and will continue in Egypt. It's going on in Tunisia. It's going on in Libya, where the, 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 the situation is, is, has been continuously boiling with uh, all sorts of mass demonstrations, uh, which the media don't report. They prefer to report armed or violent incidents. Uh, in Yemen, which has been forgotten, where the movement is carrying on with mass demonstrations, mass mobilizations. Uh, uh, in, in Bahrain, where also the movement has been, in, is, is uh, carrying on. And the movement keeps ripening in other countries where the uprising has not yet reached the same size, but it is going on. Struggles are going on uh, in Jordan. In Sudan, where, where you, you saw the, the uh, beginning of an uprising in, uh, recently, in Oman, for instance, to, to go back to, 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 to the Gulf, uh, the Gulf, where uh, I mean these are not reported, these are not seen. So that's why also that's part of this kind of gloomy picture. And sooner or later, Morocco, Algeria, the Saudi Kingdom, where you have the potential, where you have had already uh, some episodes of, uh, of, of protest. That's why I would say uh, the process is going on. But the key achievement of the Arab uprising until now is what is, in my view, encapsulated in the most famous slogan in the first part of it, and that's which I uh, have ch chosen as a title for my book, The People Want. This is the most important dimension. This is that the peoples of the, this region have learned that I mean, to ex that they, they can, when they you know, express their will, and th that by expressing their will, they can realize uh, uh, some of, uh, of their goals. And that's a very, very important turn. And I, I hardly see uh, any, any possibility to reverse that, at, at the very least, not without a major uh, uh, disaster, which, which, of course, cannot be completely excluded, but is not yet, uh, fortunately, on the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gilbert, for those very insightful thoughts. Um, next is uh, Professor Salva Ismail, uh, who is professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations and also the head of the department. And as our speakers are very well known uh, to our audience, I'm not going to introduce every one of them. So over to you. Thank you, Hassan. I'm very uh, pleased to be part of this panel. and. Uh, uh, to be engaged uh, with uh, Gilbert's book, which I read and enjoyed very much. Uh, I was uh, originally asked to be part of a discussion of the book, but then I understand I was also asked to give a, some kind of a talk. So I'm trying to kind of balance these uh, two um, uh, requests or uh, c commitments at this point. Uh, I'll start just by saying, uh, how I, I see perhaps start the main elements from uh, Gilbert's uh, book and then how I see my work in fact can speak to, to it. So uh, I start by saying that I come to this book as someone who works on uh, um, the micro level or everyday life politics. Um, so I pay attention to mundane spaces, uh, alleyways, streets, uh, street corners, uh, coffee shops and uh, 
uh, mechanic shops and that kind of what goes on these spaces and particularly the happenings in them when they come to interaction with government. So um, ordinary people, when uh, they, uh, they meet uh, and interact with agent, uh, uh, agents and agencies of government. So that's very much a micro level. So for me, Gilbert's book provides the macro picture that complements and help explain the aggregate of the daily events and episodes uh, that take place in the interaction between citizens and government and also among citizens themselves. So when citizens relate to each other um, and engage in certain forms of interaction, uh, we can actually expla uh, explain those forms of interaction by referring to the kind of macro picture that uh, Gilbert offered us in, in the book. Um, the, I think the people want furnishes us with the broad material grounds for understanding the small events, uh, the everyday events that I uh, study uh, in, in Cairo and in, in Damascus, for instance. But I think this macro level is given in concrete forms. So the, uh, the book starts with the facts uh, and builds up a persuasive argument that is also simple. Uh, over the last three to four decades, uh, the Arab Middle East experienced what Gilbert called the blocked development or fettered development, which I think is very apt to capture what was going on over these decades in terms of government policies, in terms of what uh, elites and regimes did with the material resources of uh, their countries. The figures are uh, uh, striking. Uh, and I think the, one of the most important uh, factors that Gilbert highlights and, and highlights in, also in comparative terms. So we know that actually what's happening, what happened in the region is in, in a sense uh, uh, unusual uh, if compared with what was going on in, uh, in South Asia or East Asia. Uh, so for instance, with the shift to liberalization, economic liberalization, we, and the wholesale, state, uh, wholesale sale of uh, state assets, that were the prescriptions of the international financial organizations like uh, the World Bank and IMF. The, the private sector actually fails to step in as we were told and promised uh, that, well, it's what the problem was a big state, what you need is uh, a big, large, uh, uh, um, a large private sector. But in fact, this private sector didn't step in, uh, didn't invest, it only got hold of state assets. Uh, so it didn't really perform the scripted role, and then we have all kinds of excuses for why it didn't. Uh, but, so we had a massive drop in public investment, in, including in the oil-producing countries, but also in the non-oil-producing countries. And, and the comparison, again, with East Asia, South Asia, are very instructive for us. Um, and private investment, as I just mentioned, remained weak, and of course we go, um, of course, the, when we see private investment, it goes to the most non-productive uh, economic activity, so the construct, uh, construction sector, which also Gilbert talks about. And, and I remember in 2010, just the year before the, uh, um, the events in Egypt, being there, and one of the things that I was thinking about, this massive uh, theft of public lands by a very small elite, and thinking how would the people, ordinary people, ever get hold of land to, for housing, um, or for uh, have their businesses and so on, that the, much of the public resources had been privatized and particularly in the real estate where there was this boom in construction for the elites. For So we had the gated communities and the seven star uh, resorts uh, in um, uh, beach resorts and so on. Um, so we have the facts about actually what was going on at that level in terms of state resources, but also the repercussions or um, their implication for the uh, ordinary citizens. Uh, the figures for unemployment, again, they signal a massive social uh, crisis, particularly for the young uh, that Gilbert talked about, uh, when we look at the figure whereby of the, for the, uh, the young share of the labor force, so out of only 33 to 36 percent of the youth labor force was employed. The rest, so an average of 65 percent unemployed youth. These are on the, on the job market, as in Gilbert indicates. So people, young people on the job market with no jobs. Um, and so they were the most affected. 
Um, so, and, and the most important thing is to understand that within this uh, particular modality of capitalism, which Gilbert described as uh, adventure capitalism and as uh, speculative ca capitalism. Now, this is the variant it took, uh, but it is, I think it, it was inevitable that it should be that variant given also the international context whereby, uh, um, and the region, the role of international power supporting dictators. It's a po it, it was possible for them to get away because they had cover. They had cover both locally through the, arm, the uh, apparatuses of coercion, through the militaries and the police, and they had cover internationally through the alliance, particularly with the United States. So we know that Muba the Mubaraks and the Ben Ali's and, and the Ali Salihs and so on had their backers, and the backers were um, give them cover. Uh, so I think this is an important um, a part of, uh, an, uh, or an important account for us at a macro level that is also very concrete. I want to now shift and say, okay, but what was happening at the micro level? And I will just speak very briefly about the context in the every, every day. And, and, um, and I want to say that um, and the context of the everyday is the revolutionary context that also Gilbert talks about. And it's that context that helps us to explain the uprisings and the revolutionary activism. If we consider what was going on in the everyday between citizens and the state and the everyday encounters, whether it was in the markets, on the streets, in public offices, and so on, uh, ordinary citizens that were excluded from the public wealth and resources, they were humiliated in their just and in uh, the, while trying to uh, earn their living. So uh, the incidence of Ba'azizi is not an exceptional incidence. The humiliation of Ba'azizi being slapped by uh, the officer was a typical experience for uh, all of those who entered the job market as, as informal laborers, as peddlers, as squatters and public, and, in state claimed the uh, land, uh, putting a kiosk to sell some, some kind of uh, good, whether it's imported from China or a local produced hand, handicraft, and then having to face public authorities saying, you're not supposed to be there, you're not, you shouldn't be earning your living that way, but not providing them with the alternative, but also becoming the subjects of humiliation. And here, that's where I think there is another part of this picture for us to think. In that micro level, in the everyday, there was the development of subjectivities. Subjects of rebellion, of rebellious subjects were formed. Subjects who've decided they do not want to be governed that way, they do not want to be humiliated in the everyday. They do not want to be slapped, pushed around, beaten, insulted, hauled to police stations where they're abused, tortured, uh, and uh, I'd say the word uh, humiliation, Ihana and Mahana, when I was interviewing young people in, in Cairo, were the most used terms to describe their condition. So it was the subject of humiliation deciding, but in collective and in the aggregate, they don't want to be humiliated anymore. And they express that as an anti-government, anti-regime position in, uh, in the uprising. So I would say that the infrastructure of collective action were there, uh, and uh, of course, the objective conditions uh, that uh, discussed uh, very well in Gilbert's book regarding the mode of production that existed, the control of the assets, who controlled the assets, and the impact that had, had, that had on the average, on the overall population, but particularly uh, on creating a vast segment of disadvantaged, uh, uh, increased poverty level, exclusion from education, exclusion from health services, and also, uh, constraints on the, in, uh, in the, the individual's ability to earn their living, um, having already tried to uh, circumvent government but through this informalization of labor and informal labor, that even was being undermined. Um, it's in, in, in this everyday uh, conditions and in these um, citizens' everyday encounters with government, but also in the forms that they developed among themselves to get around that, I think that we do find infrastructure of collective action. The fact that in circumventing government, uh, ordinary citizens developed networks uh, to get around, whether for jobs or to get ac access to service collectively, uh, mutual aid and help societies. Uh, there was a lot in the everyday, but also 
learning to confront the police, relearning to confront the police in, uh, on the streets, in the alleyways. Um, and, the, and I'm not saying that's the only thing that was going on. There were also protest movement, labor movement uh, organizing, and I'm um, talking particularly in reference to Egypt, but there were also other kinds of uh, um, uh, organizations happening. But I think the everyday experience of citizens, whether it is in meeting government and, and, and if the, forming a subject that rejects that mode of government, or in also organizing themselves in the everyday. And I want to tell you why the revolutionary process is continuing and the idea that actually revolutions have failed or um, being judged right now, we have in, do in political science in two dominant paradigms. One is transition to, to democracy, and if you haven't done the transition, something is wrong. Uh, there, this is a confirmation of the exceptionalism account or the failed state, which is now being used in reference to Yemen, very soon be used in reference to Syria and so on. That really ignores that people are active agents, that they are uh, pro producing their circumstances um, by organizing themselves, uh, by being productive in many different ways, not just economically productive, but producing alternative cultures. So I want to tell you from my, my recent experience in Egypt, in, and I think I'm probably running out of time, but in April, uh, uh, I looked at some of this manifestation of what I would call revolutionary activism. And two, I will mention briefly two. One is the development of uh, revolutionary media, media that is not government control and that is not business control, but that is done by uh, ordinary citizens, um, uh, kind of uh, um, citizen journalism, uh, that it seeks, and it's been developing from the time of the uh, uprising on, that seeks to counter uh, the dominant accounts that is coming from the business-owned media and the state-owned media when it comes to uh, the confrontations uh, with the police and the military. And this happened in many, many of the confrontations, whether it was in Mohammed Mah uh, Mahmoud uh, uh, confrontations in November 2000, 2011, whether it was the military's attack on the Coptic protesters in October, November 2011 by the Maspero. They had the footage, they organized street screenings, and they formed a counter public, a counter public that knows something different than what the government and what the business elite are telling them. So that's one form of opposition that is developing across the country. Citizens journalism, not just in the cities, but in the villages and the towns, uh, documenting and providing, and it, they say we're not objective. We are against the dominant powers, whether it is the military or the Muslim Brotherhood. Two very good examples of this is the collectives known as Musirin, Determined, and Kazibun, liars. Liars about the military, liars, the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, these are just examples. The other one, I would say, the politics of the informals. They exist before the revolution, the, the cal calendar revolution the, that is marked 25th of January 2011, but the revolution began before, at least the revolutionary process before it continues. The informers, the squatters, they're still squatting. Downtown Cairo has been taken over by them. You can say, well, that's illegal, but everything else, the governments, the regimes have done before was just as illegal. Now it's the ordinary people's term to reclaim their rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salva, for that uh, very complimentary um, elucidation of the micro perspective uh, to Gilbert's book. Next uh, comes uh, Adam Hanier, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Development Studies. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak uh, here today. And I want to say, begin by saying it's a really great pleasure to be able to introduce uh, this exciting book. I know many of you, I'm sure you all know, that Gilbert's work has been uh, a major reference point for both activists and academics um, over the last few years. Uh, and this book, I think, is, is certainly no exception uh, to that. I think it's important to realize that uh, Gilbert's work doesn't just come out of nowhere. It's not something new. It's, it comes from uh, an engagement with the region over, over many decades. Um, and this really is something that shines through in the book. If you haven't read it yet, I'm sure you'll be struck by the way that it does uh, cover an enormous amount of variegated struggles uh, and histories um, across the region, from Yemen to Tunisia uh, and to the Gulf. Uh, and that, I think, is one of the, the most rich aspects um, of the book. I wanted just to begin uh, 
to hi by highlighting, I think, three things that uh, Gilbert emphasized, and he emphasized them again uh, tonight, and then speak a little bit about, uh, if you like, the dynamics of revolution and counter-revolution um, in, in, in the current period. I think uh, the three uh, issues that Gilbert emphasizes that really struck me were, were firstly, uh, the emphasis on imperialism. Uh, and I think this is something that often gets uh, left out of accounts of the Middle East. Uh, imperialism is seen as being something that ended in 1945 as not, and not something that actually uh, continues today. Or it's reduced to simply a military aspect, uh, uh, the, the notion of, of military intervention without actually understanding the myriad of forms uh, through which imperialism operates in the region, pol political and economic uh, forms. And I think the historical context that are, is provided in the book helps to really bring out this aspect uh, of, of imperialism. Secondly, and Gilbert again emphasized this uh, in his talk, that we need to understand very much that these uprisings are not just about the question of democracy. They very much uh, uh, deal at the root with the way the region has been integrated into uh, the global political economy and, uh, as he describes it, the, the stalled uh, development uh, of the region. And thirdly, the emphasis on the revolutionary process. Uh, and I think it's, it's very interesting, and perhaps it would be interesting to, to talk more about this in discussion, about why is it that the Arab uh, uprisings have so often, or debates around the Arab uprisings, have so often been reduced to questions of terminology, spring or winter, uh, uh, the, the, uh, is it a revolution or not a revolution was a uh, debate I think we heard at the beginning of this phase uh, and now of course the debate should we call what's happening in Egypt a coup or not a coup uh, and these kind of reducing um, the, the process to, to simply uh, a terminological uh, debate I think the emphasis on revolutionary process helps to guard against the kinds of pessimism that we often hear uh, in, in the current period and realize that the setbacks uh, that, we, that, we, that we are facing uh, and that we do see today are actually an inevitable feature of a process that contains within itself both a revolutionary and counter-revolutionary dynamic. And it's that, that struggle. And at the question of, uh, at the heart of this question is uh, which is, I think, the question of state power. Which, which, uh, which, uh, who controls the state and in whose interests are the, is the state uh, run? And I think if we start from this uh, realization, then we can see that none of the root causes of the uprising have actually been dealt with or solved by the new political arrangements in the region. Despite the ways that the uprisings have been framed by the mainstream media and unfortunately, I think, much scholarly analysis, the root causes are not in single factors. It's not because of authoritarianism or because of unemployment or because of food prices, uh, unemployment and so forth, but rather we need to see the, uh, these roots in the way that the capitalism has formed in the region and in particular, the way that over the last few decades, the outcome of development has been this highly polarized uh, 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 process where a tiny layer of the population has benefited from its control over key moments of accumulation uh, and existing alongside a growing mass of poor and dispossessed populations through rural and urban areas. Authoritarian state structures have been the midwife of this lopsided uh, development. And I think without confronting and overcoming this totality, and in this sense seeing both the political and the economic as uh, being completely intertwined and inseparable, then there is no long-term solutions uh, to the region's problems. I wanted to emphasize one aspect of this totality, though, that I think has really come to the fore uh, over the past three years, and that is the salience uh, or the importance of the regional scale. Uh, and there are two aspects to this that I wanted to highlight. This is not the only factors, but there are two that I, I, I think often get missed in our analysis uh, because I think there tends to be an approach that we can describe as being methodologically nationalist. We look at individual struggles within individual countries without actually situating what is going on in countries uh, within the wider regional and also global context. So the two aspects of the regional scale um, that I think uh, we need to bring to the fore 
are uh, uh, the ways that Western power in the region has, has operated through both Israel and the Gulf Arab states. I think Israel's special place in this system or the, in, in this, in this uh, structure stems directly from its character as a settler colonial state that is dependent upon the dispossession of the Palestinian people. And this means that the alliance that Israel has with both the United States and, and European powers is an existential part of the state itself that uniquely insulates the state from uh, many of the domestic pressures within Israeli societies within Israeli society. So I think one of the central conclusions that we can draw from this is that the Palestinian struggle has an immense weight uh, within uh, the region as a whole. And confronting Western domination, and I think we can see this uh, in the uprisings, uh, really must pass through and be directly uh, integrated with the question of Palestine. We can see this in the sense of the way that Egypt is playing, uh, in, in the current period, playing an essential role in enforcing the blockade, for example, on the Gaza Strip. Um, this is not just true of Egypt today under the Muslim Brotherhood, it was, uh, sorry, under, under uh, the military. It was also true uh, of Egypt under uh, the Muslim government. Um, it's interesting to note, for example, that U.S. funding uh, to Egypt, uh, which the U.S. government uh, announced that it was going to uh, look at or, 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 or reduce, uh, they, the one category that was accepted from that was, and they, the way they described it, was funding related to the protection uh, of Israel. Um, that, was the, that was the one that would not be touched. Uh, the second aspect, I think, to the regional question is, is the particular role of the Gulf Arab states. And Gilbert um, has mentioned this in connection to uh, its political role in supporting various uh, uh, forces, uh, political and social forces throughout the region. Uh, I wanted to emphasize the, the, the political economic role, because I think this is also very important um, to look at. Sawa mentioned, for example, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the sale or the theft of, of public land in Egypt. Um, a major actor in this process, of course, has been the Gulf uh, states. 80% of the land auctions, for example, that took place in Cairo uh, were, were bought by uh, uh, Gulf-based uh, conglomerates in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, and, and the United Arab Emirates in, in particular. Um, so in many ways, the Gulf states have become completely intertwined with the economic processes that exist across the region. Egypt is, no ex is, is not the only example uh, this we can find throughout uh, the area. And I think it's fascinating uh, to observe that prior to the uprisings, very few people uh, actually took much interest in the Gulf itself. Uh, Gilbert is an exception to this, but uh, I think in general that's that's the case. Uh, that uh, uh, it's uh, and its regional influence, uh, and I think this has now changed. The Gulf's dramatic political ascendancy really does bear important consequences um, for the future of these struggles. And I think what it means is that the kinds of strikes, labor movements, social movements that we still see in the region, in places such as Egypt and Tunisia, inevitably come up against um, the Gulf. Uh, now, I want to, uh, I'm running short of time, so I, I want to just uh, 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 emphasize this point of the, the importance of the regional scale by, uh, by, by noting that I think one of the, the, the consequences of this is that not only uh, uh, do struggles uh, within, the, na within the, the national level import, uh, are important, but also that without challenging these hierarchies at the regional level, um, we won't see uh, a different kind of, of Middle East. Um, I'm not saying that the, these struggles will begin from the regional scale, but I think what happens uh, at the national scale inevitably is intertwined um, with these uh, regional powers and these regional regional hierarchies. And I think this is why these uprisings have caused uh, such fear in the corridors of power in places like Washington, uh, uh, Riyadh, uh, Doha, and Tel Aviv. Now, it is in the context of these uh, regional power relations that I think we can also, as well as the unfilled aspirations of the, of the people them, themselves, that we can pinpoint, I think, the brittleness of the straight structures that have arisen. It's a situation where ruling classes can't rule in the old way. They remain divided. They remain divided amongst themselves. And the populations uh, want to see real uh, change. So they do remain, in this sense, revolutionary times, part of the revolutionary process. To, employ, uh, to, to use Gramsci in this context, I think there is very little consent 
uh, that these state structures have been able to build over the past few years, uh, but there is a hell of a lot of coercion um, that is being employed uh, uh, by them. And I think we can see various strategies that are used in an attempt to build uh, this kind of consent. The rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, I think, was part of this. Um, and now, of course, we see the discourses of sectarianism. Um, uh, and we see uh, in places like Bahrain, for example, the pitting of migrant workers against uh, uh, citizens, um, the cult around Sisi and the military, uh, in Egypt, all of these things are, are various attempts to build uh, uh, an armory to the state that is, goes beyond coercion, to build a kind of consent in the state structures. But I do believe that without providing any real improvement in, in people's lives, that these, uh, these uh, attempts will, be, uh, will, will fail. And I think the weaknesses of the state structures uh, have also shaped the forms of the counter-revolutionary wave that we are now witnessing, and, and um, uh, both Salwa and Gilbert have spoken about this. Um, but I, I want to emphasize, I think, one aspect of the counter-revolutionary wave that I think um, is, is become much clearer since, since the time that Gilbert uh, has written this book. And that is, I think, there is a conscious uh, strategy of brutalization um, that is taking, pla taking place through a state of, if you like, permanent war and dispossession in, in, in many parts um, of the region. Syria, I think, is a clear example of this, but I think it's also true uh, in the case of Yemen. And I think this is something that we often underestimate, the effect of this, um, this, this process on, on, on everyday people. I think the experience of Iraq uh, through the 2000s, um, earlier in Algeria through the 1990s, and in many respects, Palestine in the post-Second uh, Intifada, or through the Second Intifada, we can see the effects that this um, has on, on populations. I don't think it's accidental that these three places, um, in these three places, Iraq, Algeria, and Palestine, we haven't seen the same levels um, of, of struggle that we have in other countries, despite the fact that the objective, um, uh, at objective level, uh, all the ingredients exist. So, having pointed this out, though, I don't think that uh, the, and I agree fully with the way Gilbert has phrased it, that this is, that the Arab uprisings are not in any sense over or in terminal decline. And I think there's many aspects of hope that we can, we can point to. One of these, and Salwa brought this out very well, is the efflorescence of new political and cultural uh, forms. Uh, and expressions that often will mock Arab, Arab leaders uh, and, uh, uh, and the kind of language that they use. Um, uh, and uh, Salwa mentioned this. I think one other interesting example is the, is the spread of uh, political graffiti and street art through, uh, through the region. Uh, particularly Egypt is a very, very good example of that. We have to, I think, also acknowledge um, the growth of the left, uh, particularly in Egypt and Tunisia. The left remains very small, of course, uh, and it remains divided, unfortunately, but uh, it certainly uh, moved much further than it was prior um, to 2011. Again, the labor movements, and this is brought out very nicely in Gilbert's book, again, most notably in, in Egypt and Tunisia, uh, the kinds of uh, new uh, uh, labor organizations that have formed, the waves of strikes that continued and actually are uh, accelerating in, in the case of Egypt. And in many cases, wildcat strikes that are taking place outside um, of the independent, even the independent trade unions that formed uh, in the earlier days. Uh, and I, I know the other kinds of social movements, I, I, I'm sure Nadia will talk in more depth around, uh, in particular, the, the women's movement um, in, in Egypt. So I would end by saying I think there is a tendency to underestimate the impact of uh, struggle on people themselves. And I think when we're assessing uh, where we are at in the Middle East, uh, we can't just look at what is going on at the, at the level of the state. We can't just ask who's in power, which political party appears to be um, uh, uh, hegemonic in, in, in the state apparatus, but actually see how has this process, uh, processes, how has the involvement in struggle, involvement in demonstration strikes and all the, the, uh, the myriad of activities, how has this actually changed uh, uh, people themselves? And I think these implications um, are ignored often, uh, 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 where the, and it's concentrated just on, those, on, the, on the top levels of political uh, success or temporary alliances at the top of the state. 
The uprisings have irrevocably, I think, changed the political consciousness of an entire uh, generation. And this, I think, is the primary legacy. Uh, and uh, I do believe very much that the process uh, uh, will continue. Uh, the changes that we have seen in people's consciousness, the new kinds of social movements, um, will leave us, I think, and I hope, in a better place uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, uh, for your presentation. And last but not least is Professor Nadia Al-Ali, who is a professor of gender studies in the Center for Gender Studies at SOAS. Thank you, Hassan. Um, well, thank you very much, there for inviting me to be here. And um, now, after Salwa and Adam already so eloquently uh, engaged with Jubair's book and really uh, drawn out the main points and the main contributions, I'm not going to go over that. I mean, I very much agree with um, the points made. I guess from my perspective, what stood out for me are three points. Um, one is that I strongly feel that too much work on the Middle East, especially that is written sort of on the moment and trying to capture current events, fails to historicize. And um, Jill Burr's book uh, is really refreshing in that because of the fact, as um, Adam already pointed out, um, that he's been working for so long on the region and also because of specific political economy approach and methodology, uh, there is this historical context that is so important. Secondly, um, as someone who is mainly working on women and gender issues, I'm always confronted with what we might call the culturalization of issues. And it is so useful to have an in-depth political economy approach that really speaks against, that challenges this whole notion of exceptionalism and Arab culture, Middle East culture. And thirdly, and it has already been mentioned by both Salva and Adam, what really speaks to me is that, you know, while Gilbert is not one of those people who's sort of overtly optimistic, or the, the point that I really, that really resonates is what is so impressive and what is so big and revolutionary is the expression of want, what we want, what people want. Having said that, I think where I would squabble a bit with Gilbert, and this is where I'm going to focus on now, is the idea of the people. I mean, clearly from a feminist and gender perspective, um, I would argue that the people uh, are always, they are men and women and they're gendered interests. And so what I'd like to do is to really maybe build on Gilbert's radical analysis and try to complicate the picture a little bit by saying that I think it is really important to look at gender not as something that is sort of marginal to what is happen happening, but very key. And I think feminist scholars, for a long time, we've moved away from privileging gender as an analytical category and we are incorporating, we are recognizing intersectionality in the way gender intersects with class, how it intersects with ethnicity. And I think this is a time maybe to open up a debate with colleagues as Gilbert, although I know Gilbert is very open to feminist analysis, but in more general terms that maybe also for Marxist scholars it is important to recognize gender not simply as you know, something that happens on the side, but actually as central, certainly in terms of the unfolding of events. Now, I would say that, um, of course, that gender would be central to both revolutionary and counter-revolutionary processes in the region, and I'm actually going to focus on Egypt as well, did not come as a surprise to many of us. I mean, certainly, you know, feminist scholars or activists with historical knowledge of the region, um, clearly after an initial, uh, the initial phase of anti-Mubarak and national sentiments, sort of initially in Egypt, there was very much the sense of, we are here as Egyptian citizens, we are not here as women, but that changed very quickly, it changed from the 8th of March 2011, International Women's Day. And as we, see, as we saw developments unfolding, it was, became very clear that um, women and gender and body politics actually became a very central aspect to 
political contestations in post-Mubarak Egypt. And when I say, you know, gender, actually I don't just mean women, I mean men as well. And um, we have uh, with us uh, this evening Professor Denise Candiotti, who I think very convincingly argued at some point that, um, well, actually uh, a year ago, um, that many of the, th the developments that we see unfolding in terms of the targeting of women, the targeting of female protesters, um, the most prominent examples were, of course, the forced virginity tests of protesters, the incident of the, the woman, the so-called woman with the blue bra, and, and so on, that these were not coincidental, that these were very much part of a process where the state very much recognizes that sort of the old uh, ways of authoritarian patriarchy state doesn't really work anymore because women were very much part of um, political protest, of uh, public spaces, very much part of trade unions, um, all kinds of political parties and so on. And in that situation, the reaction, the backlash is particularly strong and particularly violent. And um, I, I would like to also uh, say that um, at this point, though, um, as a feminist scholar and activist, I have to uh, admit that I'm a bit at a loss to try to uh, not, but not necessarily to analyze. I still feel that I have the theoretical tool to analyze what is happening. But in terms of positioning um, myself um, politically, particularly in relation to what is happening in Egypt, I have to say that I feel very astonished and shocked by what I call political acrobatics or intellectual acrobatics by many of my feminist friends right now in Egypt, who in the context of uh, the recent, most recent coup, have been, and in the context of being uh, full of hatred of the Muslim Brotherhood, have come out in support of the military. And um, I have to say, while I you know, understand the, the hatred and disappointment and the well, the resistance to the Muslim Brotherhood, not on behalf of many feminists, but secular intellectuals, including many leftist intellectuals, um, I find it very difficult to sort of follow the leap of um, supporting the military. Um, and also very much supporting that in the name of the will of the people. And I think here, you know, we really have to ask who are the people in that context, because clearly also the supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood are the people. Having said that, I do feel uncomfortable sitting in London and passing judgment. I mean, I do realize that it's much more difficult when you are uh, in Egypt and uh, when you know, you're faced. Um, I mean, I don't have to, I didn't have to live under the Muslim Brotherhood. So I am deeply aware that things look, look different from the inside. But yet again, I like to sort of <laughs> jump from one nuance to, to the other. I do also disagree with people like um, recently Judith Butler. She, Butler, she gave a talk in, um, in Istanbul in late September 2013. She gave a talk to a group of students about the freedom of assembly. But Butler refused to comment directly on the Gezi protests and she was proclaiming her lack of legitimacy as a foreign commentator on local events. And I have to say, while I appreciate Butler's humili humility and sensitivity in avoiding the frequently uh, patronizing commentaries of Western-based academics and so-called experts, I'm personally troubled by the idea that you can only comment on it if you're from there, and the kind of construction of an authentic voice. And I'm also very troubled with the way that many of my friends and colleagues in Egypt right now do discredit some critical voices on the basis that they are Western voices. And I think that is, um, certainly I think Western media and Western academics do get it wrong. We all get it wrong at times, but there's not one voice. There's a range of different voices as there are also different voices. Um, in Egypt, but this growing trend in Egypt has translated in a vilification or many people are vilifying Western media and Western academics. Um, and in that context, um, well, I mean, the argument goes the West does not understand and blindly supports the brotherhood by calling 
what was another instance of revolution, a coup. So that has been a widespread argument. Um, so I think that, you know, as I already mentioned, from a feminist perspective, the idea that the people uh, often glosses over uh, a range of different interests, including gendered in interest. And in, in terms of um, what I would prescribe to as a transnational feminist perspective, it looks more carefully at how gender intersects with other hierarchies of power and systems of inequality. And I would say that in the current political context, I would argue that the struggle against gender-based inequalities in legislation, the widespread sexual harassment of women, the exclusion of women from decision-making processes, etc., intersects with the prevailing political culture and practices of authoritarianism, as well as neoliberal economic policies and practices that contribute to profound economic crisis. And here I would say that I've, I felt troubled by the focus on sexual harassment only on behalf of many um, feminist organizations. Clearly it's a huge issue. Clearly it's a very important issue, but sexual harassment does not exist in a vacuum. And sexual harassment has to be linked to other forms of violence. It has to also be linked to structural violence related to economic inequalities. And so I guess what I'm sort of sharing with you is sort of my own troubles and dilemmas, you know, as a feminist looking at what is happening in Egypt, uh, not wanting to be patronizing and passing judgment, but at the same time also refusing to be silenced in the name of you are out there, uh, you don't understand, recognizing that, of course, aside from the fact that in the West there are very different voices, including, you know, the media, that, of course, also in Egypt and elsewhere in the region, there are very different voices, and there are, of course, many Egyptians who refuse to be drawn into this, either we support the Brotherhood or we support uh, the military. And I think there should be space to do that, to have this criticism, but also to have some humility and to recognize that it's easier for us to do it here than if you actually live in Cairo. Thank you, or elsewhere. Well. well, thank you very much, Nadia, for uh, that illuminating perspective and for uh, uh, very frankly and forthrightly sharing with us your uh, uh, dilemmas. Uh, this leaves us uh, with a fair amount of time for discussion, uh, which, as I said at the outset, is very much uh, the purpose of gatherings like this. I'd like to take questions in batches of three at a time, and if you can keep your questions uh, brief to the point, and also if it is directed at anybody specific on, on the panel, please feel free to specify. So we'll go in batches of three, and I already apologize if I cannot, because of lack of time, accommodate everybody who puts up their hand, but I'll do my best. So we have to, we're going to have two roaming microphones. Uh, wait till the microphone reaches you, and then uh, ask, because, uh, as I said, uh, we are being filmed. So I'm going to go with you, Elisa, and one from there, you gentlemen there, yeah, and one here. And we'll come back. Thank you very much uh, for, for all of you, for all the to all the panel, for uh, this very stimulating discussion, um, and especially to Gilberto for uh, engaging in this initiative. Sorry. Yeah. Um, to engage in this initiative of the book, which I really much looking forward to read. By um, glancing at the table of contents, I was surprised not to see a chapter on social mobility. And maybe my surprise is uh, misplaced, and maybe I have to read the book. Um, I have to say my, my surprise uh, may come from uh, um, an emerging literature informed by behavioral economics, uh, uh, which uh, put forward the argument uh, that uh, um, certain uh, situation, certain policy, such as uh, the guaranteed employment in uh, Egypt, uh, um, Make, may um, create uh, a reference point in people's minds. And then the disappointment uh, or uh, the deception not to be able to fulfill that reference point uh, 
enhance a certain uh, movement. So I was, uh, I, I would be interested to know if you had considered writing that uh, section on social mobility or uh, if it wasn't needed. Okay, <laughs> thank you. And, and the question, yeah, there. Uh, thanks for, uh, thanks Gilbert and Dave panel for, for illuminating and uh, complementary presentations which uh, further elucidated the book for me and I'm really looking forward to completing the reading. Uh, my question is about the regional context but I want to change the wording a little and talk about uh, Pan-Arabism. Now if, uh, and I'm talking about a Pan-Arabism which is very different from that of the 50s and the kind of Pan-Arabism of the regimes or Pan-Arabism of the um, um, Al Jazeera model, uh, but uh, a Pan-Arabism of what I consider a social democratic genuine movement of the globalized age, which you've described because you selected political economy as an important basis. And my question is this, uh, if it is important um, that uh, the social classes the, the, the ruling classes, sorry, the ruling classes of the Arab East are collaborating with each other in order to disenfranchise the masses. Is it not also important for the mass, the people, who, who, whoever they are, and, and Nadia is right, uh, to come together across borders, uh, across national borders and national separations in order to, to achieve um, a, a, a fairer and more just society across the region. And I'm, I'm referring here in one sentence to uh, Adam's question about the Gazans, of course, and how they were treated by all the post-Mubarak regimes. Thank you, and the third question, gentleman over there, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for, for, the, for all the presentations and, and for the book as well, which I, I really enjoyed, uh, kind of an, until the conclusion. And I wanted to, to ask you about the, about the conclusion, really, and whether, whether you, you kind of, I mean, and, and to be honest, anybody on the panel, and, and whether you think about the conclusion maybe differently since, since the coup in Egypt and, and the development. I mean, I, 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 I hope I don't misrepresent you, but uh, I think you end kind of by talking about the need of a, a Nasserism without Nasser or a, a kind of a developmental uh, um, program in, 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 uh, in the region. And you see the kind of main people uh, to be able to deliver that as the UGTT in, in, uh, in Tunisia and, uh, and the kind of uh, Sabahi and the, and the independent trade unions in, in Egypt. Um, and I mean, I mean, certainly in Egypt, the speed uh, which both Sabahi and, and, and Abu Aita kind of jumped into the, the, the government with the, with the army. Um, and I mean, maybe a, a, a slightly different role uh, but of the UGTT in, in, in the negotiations now in Tunisia, whether you see that differently. Um, and I mean, I, I was kind of surprised. I thought the book uh, incredibly uh, painted the picture of the region and showed how the movements from below uh, are kind of are sh are shaping the event. And, and, and I, I wasn't really sure about the... the that kind of conclusion coming from that, from that picture you painted. Okay, I think uh, it would be appropriate to go back to Gilbert because a lot of these comments are directed at you. And then if uh, anybody from the panel wants to add comments, we'll... Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Hassan. Thank you very much for, for your questions. I'll try to, to, to address them uh, as briefly as possible so that we have uh, time to, to, to carry on. And if my colleagues want to say something. Uh, um, very quickly, I want to, uh, on the issue of, of, of gender, I mean, I completely agree and uh, enjoyed listening to, to all three of you, but I mean, uh, the kind of critical remarks or addition uh, that uh, Nadia put forward is something I, 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 I fully appreciate. And I should say that when I describe the fundamental feature of the states and the region as patrimonial, this is already gendered. Patrimonial is the same root from patriarchy and all that. And this, is, this refers to, to the, the nature of, of the setting that exists uh, in the region. And of course, everything you said, uh, the, therefore, 
uh, flows from that, I would say. Uh, uh, on the issue of, 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 uh, of social uh, mobility, if, if you mean the Galal Amin kind of explanation, I, I, I've never, I've not been convinced uh, in, his, uh, in, in his analysis of that. But if you mean what you refer to, that is this uh, blocked perspectives of uh, employment and all that, well, it's not called, there's no section called social mobility, but there's a section called graduate unemployment, and it explains uh, these issues and why this issue is very acute in the region. I spoke of uh, youth unemployment. The region is characterized because of the relative richness of the region. This is not the poorest region of uh, the Asian African uh, ensemble. On the contrary, it's, it's uh, one of the richest. And it is characterized by a high level, high rate of, of, uh, of uh, uh, high ratio of, uh, of uh, enrollment in, uh, in, uh, in higher education and therefore produces a high proportion of, of graduate who used to be indeed in previous regimes uh, uh, taken, in, I mean, given jobs uh, by right or automatically, and this this has been uh, cut off, and this is one of the, the, the key roots of, of this uh, massive anger and the role of these youth, uh, these young people among the 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 the, 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 the overall youth in the, in all that. Uh, on the issue of um, of the regional connections of the struggles, I mean, from below. Well, you don't have it maybe in the pan-Arabist form, because when you use such term, people will think of the Ba'ath Party or whatever, the Nasserist movement. But you have it at a much higher degree, thanks to the, uh, I don't know, uh, Facebook, internet, and all that. I mean, the connection, the, the, the way people follow uh, what's happening in the region is unprecedented. Of all, also, the, the role, I mean, the, the media has shifted, the satellite TVs and all that I want get back in that I speak and all that of all that in, in, in detail and that's why actually we have, we have never seen uh, something like the, 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 the speed at which uh, all this has spread to an entire region uh, it started uh, in, in the center of, of Tunisia and, and spread from there to, 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 to practically not a single country in the region practically not a single country in the region except these extremely artificial statelets that are uh, Qatar and United Arab Emirates. Uh, only these two, actually, because all the rest of the GCC countries have been affected by, 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 by the, the wave, by the, the uprising and the strikes. And this, is, this contagion is also part of, of a regional dimension. Uh, um, and uh, about the, 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 the conclusion, well, I'm not calling for Nasserism uh, without Nasser. This is not the, the issue. I, I'm pointing to the, 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 the Nasserist legacy in a country like Egypt as reflecting uh, a progressive uh, uh, aspiration uh, of the masses. And this is something that I could notice in Egypt before the uprisings through my, I mean, uh, my uh, travels to the country, discussion with normal people, I could see how much nostalgia there, there was for, uh, for, for uh, the time of Nasserism, seen as a time of, uh, of social and national dignity, uh, not uh, by the political militants, of course, who saw it as a despotic uh, uh, regime, but for the, the vast mass uh, of the people. And, and so this... Uh, uh, this potential, which expresses, uh, expressed itself uh, in the uh, presidential election uh, to the s astonishment of everybody with uh, uh, Sabahi, uh, not betting on the per person Sabahi who, who said very silly things uh, uh, since then, but uh, the fact that he uh, came third with no means, I mean, ridiculous means compared to, to at least four other candidates, uh, and, and number one in the two main urban concentrations of the country, points to a very important potential. And the same potential is, is there in a more organized and therefore better form, and not Nasserist, in Tunisia, in the workers' movement. This is the UGTT, and of course it is, it is I mean, uh, uh, in some way, uh, the, the, in, in Tunisia, they are lucky, lucky that uh, the role that the, the, the army played in, in, in Egypt is being played by the union movement. Now, I, I'm, I regret the fact that the union movement plays the role of arbiter instead of, of aspiring uh, to, uh, to powers. I won't get into this, this discussion, but that's the point. So, uh, uh, no, I, I very much stick to, to my conclusion. That's the, 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 the kind, 
of, of uh, mass potential that exists that will be crucial in, uh, in bringing this revolutionary process to, uh, to a conclusion. And uh, anyone that believes that the uh, Egyptian uh, will be led by Marxism or whatever, I think is very much illusioned. Uh, the, the, the natural or let's say more normal form of, of progressive consciousness in the country is this reference to this kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, so I would say not Nasserism without Nasser, uh, but if you want Nasserism without the dictatorship, Nasserism from below, Nasserism under mass popular control, uh, that's the kind of aspiration that can mobilize the masses and combine the, the, the kind of, as people perceive it, there's a part, part, part of mythification, that's clear. But the way people uh, perceive and conceive this legacy and the people want this discovery, that they are the heroes, they're not waiting for a hero, as Nasser said uh, in, the, uh, in his philosophy of the revolution, are all waiting for a hero. Now the, the, the people are the hero, and that's the, 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 the key change. Thank you. I, I just wanted actually to follow up on the last question because I had very similar question in my mind um, and I will quote uh, or make a reference to a particular page, page 66 of the book. You say, pa the path out of this fetter development is public sector investment and the state. Uh, and the question that I wrote here to you, are we going back to the 1950s and 60s and what does that mean in both economic and political terms? I think... Uh, in a sense, uh, that line appeared earlier in the book than the conclusion. I mean, you know, page 66 in particular. So. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, I think this discussion is now uh, gaining some momentum. So let me go back to you uh, for three more questions. And uh, so you will be first. Anybody from this side? No? Okay. Any other? I, I, I had, uh, please don't raise your voice. I had the courtesy, everybody here will remember, I apologize in advance if I cannot, if they, they, don't, don't, yes, please. Don't waste, don't waste time. If you be patient, we may actually get to you as well. So, please show courtesy to everybody here and control your sentiment. I am not. Please be patient. Right. Uh, uh, okay, let's have our question. Uh, that's for uh, yeah. Gilbert. Uh, Can you speak into the microphone, please? No, just speak directly into it, yeah. And closer. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. Closer. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, Mr. Gilbert, uh, you very aptly uh, uh, narrowed down the achievements and the outcome of uh, Arab Springs to the people want. Uh, if, if we uh, further uh, dissect it, it, we can reduce it to the, the people's want, or the want of the people. Because if we look at it, it's the want which uh, has been unifying uh, element in that, which brought diverse people from uh, ideologically, economically, socially, and politically diverse backgrounds. They brought them together. But one element I, I would like you to uh, shed some light on, if you have discerned any movement or any development in terms of organically, locally, uh, a growth of political thought which could guide the people uh, how to get what they want. Thank you. Okay, All right, thank you. Now, please, the microphone is yours, but Please be courteous and show respect for the panel and phrase your well, question. Thank you for showing respect for, for my patience. Anyway, two quick questions to the author specifically. Uh, and uh, I'm coming from a think tank. Uh, the first question is, do you think the Arab people's, you know, uh, uprisings, as you call them, can learn from the AKP uh, in Turkey? Or are they totally, you know, divergent, parallel, uh, strands vis-a-vis -vis the army and the deep state, uh, as you refer to. I think that's very important. And secondly, you touched on it, the GCC. 
Yeah, when is this storm going to hit this region big time? You, 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 you did touch on it, but you didn't expand on it. Thank you. Uh, that was two questions, but I'm happy to take another one. The, the gentleman just behind the... Yes, that's... Um, I would like to thank the panellists for their insightful comments upon the topic. Um, I would like to turn your attention to the refugee crisis, which resulted from uh, the violent conflict in the region, and especially, like, mainly having worked with uh, Libyan refugees in Italy and Syrian refugees in Turkey and Greece. I would like to, um, um, for you to briefly comment on what exactly is the role of the diaspora um, um, in Europe, um, whether they give legitimacy to some of the social movements, um, whether they're counter-revolutionary forces. Um, as you said, um, the youth unemployment is one of the root causes. Um, if they decide to flight and not fight, really, um, what is their role in the Arab uprising? And um, not only of the refugees with, um, post-2011, but also of the migrants who moved to Europe prior to 2011. Okay. Uh, let, let me invite others on the panel first, uh, and then come back to Gilbert if he wants to respond. Nadia? Um, the first question, I think, was the first one about the people. The people want... Yes. Um, I agree that at some point, uh, certainly in the, at the moment of coming together because of the common goal of ousting a dictator, there was the coming together of want. But, and here I might differ with you know, Gilbert. I would say that right now it's what we see more is an expression of divergence and differences and uh, actually a, a situation where different people want different things. And um, also, and this I, I realize that I make myself very unpopular here, I would also say that sometimes the people, whoever the people are, might get it wrong, I would say, and that it's not, um, it's not quite clear right now who the people are. I think, that's, I, th I think that's my problem in terms of this phrase, the people want. Did you have Iran in mind when you th said that they might get it wrong? Uh, no, I didn't have Iran in mind, uh, actually. But uh, <clears throat> I didn't think about that. I mean, I, I, I mean, okay, I don't, you know, I don't want to sort of sound elitist, but I think there is a line between a populism that, you know, that people might. I mean, right now, for instance, I give the example what I mentioned in terms of Egypt, and. Lots of people in Egypt right now glorify Sisi, or lots of people, um, you know, glorify the military. I mean, okay, there are lots of people that doesn't make it right. Adam? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to make a brief comment on the, the question of the Gulf and the, the GCC, and, uh, you know, can we expect change there, if you like? And I think one, and it's, it's certainly true, as Gilbert points out, that, uh, you know, we, there, there were struggles in, in uh, particularly in Bahrain, but elsewhere in, in the GCC states. Um, but I do think one of the important factors we need to keep in mind here uh, is the weight of uh, uh, migrant work migrant workforces within uh, the Gulf. Uh, in all these states, all of the six GCC states, at least 50% of the labor force uh, is, is constituted by migrant workers who have, of course, um, completely uh, uh, differential rights in terms of that they don't hold citizenship, they, they're, they're not allowed to uh, uh, have any kind of residency in the country without uh, a work permit, these kinds of things. And I think this casts a particular character to the nature of political struggle in uh, the Gulf states. In some cases, such as the UAE and elsewhere, you have up to 80% um, of the workforce made up with these, if you like, temporary migrant uh, workers. So I think this is something I think is often uh, missed in um, when we're talking about the Middle East. Uh, we're talking about, for example, uh, labor, uh, the working class, if you like, in, in the areas, that it's, it's, we need to consider this other major component um, uh, across uh, as part of uh, uh, how we understand labor in the Arab world. And so I think the earlier question that was raised around Arab unity or pan-Arabism, uh, that's, I think, solidarity with, with workers who are not Arab 
uh, who are in the Gulf is, is a very important aspect of trying to, to change this regional, regional system. Okay, I, I think uh, let's go for the next round of questions. Uh, I can see hands up there. Anybody else? Well, well you, yeah. yeah. My question is to uh, Nadia. Thank you for your uh, observations. But specifically the many voices, you know. Uh, for example, Hamdin Sabahi was not just an Nasserist. He was neither Filul nor was he uh, an Islamist. And the same with Sisi. It's not just glorification of the military because Sisi was portrayed in the beginning like you know the pious Muslim on one hand, and on the other hand the progressive um, Americanized, American educated you know uh, PR machine behind him, uh, handsome uh, spokesman to woo the women. So it's not really binary either or. And the same with the with the people. You, it, they're not just pro-military or anti-government. You have Hizb Kanaba who went to the street and they, they're neither. You have, uh, you have so many different shades in there that it is an oversimplification to just you know, say they're either this or that or the Sabahi is Nasserist or whatever. There, there are so many different shades and this is maybe the reason why the, the Western media or the, the antagonism against it is so, you know, because they don't see these shades or they don't acknowledge them, not, not don't see them, they don't want to acknowledge them because it's so much easier to have a dialogue that is binary. Mm -hmm. okay. Right at the back. Uh, and then you over there, yeah. My name is, uh, name is Alex. I don't very well speak English because now I am learning English. Uh, I know the uh, Ashkar at University of Paris is Parvit. I know. Uh, you speak, I, don't, uh, I look the name, the Naja Adam Salaf, name the Arabic or the Farsi. All day you speaking about the revolutionary Arabic is okay. But you never speaking about the revolution in Kurdistan, Kurdish. Now, in the in the Turkey, in the Syria, in Syria, in Turkey, in Iraq, in Arab, uh, Iran, uh, there are revolution in Kurd Kurdish of people. What in the, the in the Middle East, they're living another the people. Why you only will speak about the revolutionary uh, Arabic, revolution of the Palestinian, what, why you, what are you, uh, don't you speaking, speak about the revolution Kurdish people? Okay. Why? Thank you, and uh, thank you. And uh, there's a question up there. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to um, sort of uh, see if to, to kind of restate the question uh, about uh, the regional level and the question about pan-Arabism, because uh, it's also a question of the roots of revolution. Um, I mean, I organized a conference uh, at Cambridge which tried to imagine what revolutions might be like today in 2005, and there was a sort of a widespread failure, if you might like, of imagination amongst some of the people who spoke, Tony Negri being a, uh, an, an exception, but one of the people who was prepared to, as it were, uh, uh, offer something uh, concrete was Robin Blackburn, who linked uh, the occupation of Iraq with a potential uh, democratic revolution. So where you have the so-called revolutionary empire that exports revolution, it in fact generates revolutions against it. And in a way, <clears throat> I think that it's, it's important to integrate this kind of insight into both the, the causality of revolution and not merely to see it as a, some kind of response to deep ne neoliberalism if we are to have a, a strategic perspective. Be, um, Adam mentioned Gaza, but we could also mention the, the, the kind of interventions that have deformed revolutions, for example, in Libya and, uh, and, and now in, but potentially in Syria. So in other words, the, f from the roots to some kind of strategy, taking the, focusing on the region would, would seem to be quite important for, for radical thinking. And I, and I was interested in Gilles Bez's response particularly uh, to, to, to that question, but also uh, Adam, thank you. Right. Do you want to 
start? Yeah, um, I will start by saying, uh, excuse me, but I haven't understood exactly your point, the question. So uh, sorry if I can't uh, reply because I, I, I didn't really understand what, what, what the question was. Um, maybe you, we, we can discuss it later on if you want. Uh, uh, f f very, very quickly uh, again, uh, the, well, the, the Kurdish question, I'm definitely uh, not one that can be accused of not uh, paying attention. I've even uh, got uh, physically aggressed because of my support for the Kurdish uh, cause. But we are not facing, unfortunately, a Kurdish uprising. We are facing an uprising in the Arab-speaking region. And, and I use Arab speaking also because precisely, uh, and I explained that in the book, I don't want to, to give any impression that it is an ethnic definition or a, anything li like that. I, I know very well that, and I'm taking into account the fact that uh, uh, there are uh, uh, important uh, uh, fractions or sometimes majorities of the population in the region uh, who, uh, who, who would not define themselves as Arab um, in North uh, Africa uh, in, uh, uh, in particular. But again, this is a, a question about a specific <laughs> uprising that developed for various reasons in this uh, 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 region. Uh, I don't uh, uh, discuss the 2009 uh, Green Movement, for instance, as it was called uh, in Iran in the book. So uh, I don't discuss uh, what's happening in Turkey. So I, there's no reason why, I, unless you believe that there is an Arab, an uprising, specific uprising in Iraqi Kurdistan, which I have not seen, uh, and I, I was recently having lunch with a friend just coming from there, who was one of the militants there, and he was telling me about the situation. It doesn't look at all like an uprising, unfortunately. So anyhow, uh, uh, the, the, the issue of, of uh, the, the, the refugees, I mean, I'm again here, uh, sorry, but I, I'm not in a position because this is not something that I have uh, really examined closely what the refugees specifically from here or, or there, how they are divided politically, but I guess uh, uh, that uh, they reflect uh, uh, basically what's happening or, or who is victimized by, by, uh, in each country. Now, as for the migrants, they reflected the various kind of, of trends that you find if you take the Tunisian immigration, the Egyptian immigration, or the rest, they just reflect not necessarily the same proportions uh, of the political forces at home, but they are basically uh, uh, crossed by the same, uh, the same current. Uh, as for the uh, learning from the AKP, if you mean that uh, there could be uh, some uh, ways in the region which would reproduce the way the uh, AKP, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, pushed back in that, in that context, it's true, the army in, in, in its barracks, uh, I, there's a, there are long developments in the book to explain why the AKP model does not apply, has, doesn't have any of its real ingredients in the region, starting with the, the, the fact that its social base is a really, a really existing uh, uh, export-oriented capitalism, which does not exist. Uh, 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 in, in the region. Uh, and finally, to, to remain very quick, about the, the, the whole issue of, of again, the, 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 the people want and all that. Um, uh, first of all, uh, yeah, well, what I ex explained, I, I put it and I, quote, I, I quoted that here, a, a speech I gave the, for the first anniversary of the Tunisian uprising in Sidi Bouzid, in the city where everything started from. Uh, in, uh, in December 2011, uh, I used the formula, I said, uh, this is a region which had seen development with corruption, I mean, now added, and, and dictatorship. It went from that into corruption and dictatorship without development. What is needed now is development without corruption and dictatorship. It's simply, simply putting it, but that's the key point, that is, the kind of developmentalist perspective, and again, uh, either you, believe, you say there's no way out except, I don't know, by some utopia, call it however uh, you want, or you believe, or you, you try to stress that uh, uh, there is no 
way out of the economic crisis without a massive involvement of the state in the economy, that this is not a region where the neoliberal recipes of the World Bank can work. They may work in this or that country where they have very specific conditions, but definitely not in this part of the world where private, the private sector is not going, is not, and is even less now, going to be the engine of, uh, of development. And that's why you need a massive in intervention of the state, but not the kind of dictatorial state creating corruption and all that, but under popular control. This is the kind of, let's say, relatively, relatively realistic utopia one can uh, put forward uh, in the region uh, and not, uh, not aim uh, uh, much higher. Uh, uh, than that. So that, that's, that's what I, I mean by, by this legacy. And again, uh, when I, I mean, at the level of, of the region, uh, uh, the, these, this kind of aspiration, uh, I think the left would be very wrong in, uh, uh, in attacking uh, this, uh, this, uh, the, the, the Nasserist nostalgia. One should, on the contrary, say, well, it has a lot of positive uh, 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 achievements which we want to to, rep to repeat at a higher and deeper level, but it has a lot of pro there are a lot of problems which led to its failure, and there you can you can uh, explain uh, what these uh, uh, problems are. And finally, the issue of the people want it's not populistic. It's not a matter of saying everything the pe the people whatever people wants is fine. If the people want their own alienation by supporting a despot. This is not what I mean by the people want, the will of the people. This is not the same. And as a, as a feminist, you, you, you can have the parallel very clearly. I'm very much for the self-determination of women, okay? But I, I, I won't support women who interiorize patriarchal uh, and male domination. And you know that there are a lot, especially in our part of the world, who would even argue fiercely for, for what you and I would consider terribly oppressive uh, uh, structures. So this is the key point. Uh, the people want here is taken in precisely this form, this idea of the sovereignty to the people. And let me say one thing. I believe that one of the most radical moments in this uh, whole process is the 30th of June in Egypt, the recent one. Even though it has been again co-opted, uh, uh, usurpated by the military, as it was in, in February 2011. Why was it like that? Because this is a very clear uh, uh, illustration of a more radical conception of democracy than that that we have here, this cradle of democracy, where, you know, the sovereignty of the people it's just one day when they put the bulletin in, in the, the, the ballot box. And that's it. And then after that, for whatever the, the, the length of the mandate of the elected, they do whatever they want. This conception of democracy is undemocratic. And a real conception of democracy, the basic the, the, uh, 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 condition for a real democracy is the right to recall. And that's how the electors, the people, can exert control over the elected. They have, should have the right to change those elected if those elected fail to uh, 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 fulfill their aspirations. And that's, I think, it's a very important thing. And you can see the cleavage in the comments on what happened in 30 June and the Western governments all embarrassed or oh, a democratically elected government because they see themselves in that. If tomorrow you have a mass movement in this country asking Cameron to, uh, you know, to, to step down and organize new elections, I, I will definitely not defend Cameron because he is democratically elected. Well, I'm happy uh, to give our panelists one minute each if they have final thoughts, and if they don't, uh, join you in thanking uh, Gilbert for a wonderful book and one which will obviously uh, open up even more debates in the future days, months, years to come. And my co-panelists and of course yourself for your patience and for your courtesy and, uh, <laughs> and for, for timekeeping. Uh, it's been a long day, but I hope it has been very rewarding. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.